Well, welcome back. I hope you're all re-energized after a strong coffee. Uh, it's, uh <laughs> um, first and foremost, uh, on behalf of the European Association, uh, the European Society for Organ Transplantation, we would like to thank Focus Patient and Petnila in particular for uh, your kind invitation. My name is uh, Devi May. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of ESOT, and I'll be serving as your moderator for the next uh, 40 minutes for the session entitled Guidelines for Organ uh, Donation, and uh, you'll be hearing now from an outstanding expert panel uh, on this very timely subject. Uh, the shortage of available organs has prompted many uh, countries to develop procedures and systems to increase supply, but it has also stimulated a number of challenges uh, across Europe. So now moving along, along to our session, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. He doesn't need introductions anymore because he's been talking a lot today already. Uh, so if I can ask uh, Gabriel Onisco to come back on stage. Thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah, it's one of my traits. I speak a lot now. Um, so, hands up, who is aware, uh, if we can get in, in this, of this guide? One, two, three, four. Right, so we've got a bit of work cut out for us. So, we talked about a lot today, patient safety, shared decision, um, Stratos talk about equity of access as everyone else. So the question is, why do we need the guide like this? Because one of the points that Stratos made was, well, you can create supranational guidelines, but actually it's not up to the WHO or Council of Europe, it's actually down to the individual countries to do it. So why do we need this? Well, let's give you a bit of history. That's it, history is done. Um, so, uh, the CDPTO, for short, um, is basically a committee uh, created by Council of Europe to look oversee transplantation and its development and very much decided to put a, a series of guidelines and a technical guide in 2002. And that's when it started to look at why do we need to look at donation and transplantation? So to address practices that were different, to bust some myth, and so on. So in 20, uh, so it called this TO guide now, and that's what it's it's uh, it's known as. And the latest edition um, was 2018 was published, and the most recent one came out recently, and that's it there. So what does he want to do? Very simple objective sound information and guidance to stakeholders to optim optimize the quality and minimize the risk of donation and transplantation. A very admirable goal. And then looking at quality and safety, which are particularly relevant given that we're pushing the boat to various complex donors uh, with infections, with cancers and so on. But how do you move from objective to actual reality? So, very simple. Um, it's really trying to produce up-to-date information, and this guide is reviewed every so often. Because it's Europe, we have a pan-European uh, authorship from all competent authorities and some organizations, including ESOT, and really is to capture that variation in practice and to help spread the best one. So there's really three target audiences. One is on a practical level, is looking at what happens out there what do you need to know if you have a complex donor, for example? But it's also the entire pathway. So it's also an educa education material from donation up to transplantation. And finally, because it's written by professionals, it has to uh, tell the policymakers what is important. It's a Bible, quite a big one, um, 19 chapters. But what's different is each chapter is written um, and it's complementing the following ones. But the key point here is the appendices because they have additional information and examples of good practice that allow you to say, yeah, I like that. I think we should introduce this in our country and so on. So that's very important because it's, it's, it's stimulating that exchange of information. So for example, chapter two is identification and referral. Chapter three is determination of neurological criteria. And then you go into uh, Appendix 3, which takes you through a nice chart detailing what you need to do and how you need to do it, as an example from Spain. Similarly, um, you look at characterization of donors, and again, you've got examples from the UK, 
uh, translated in German and English, uh, and examination from, from the US and so on. So brings together all the information you need to have. So what's new in the most recent one? Um, as I said, it's updated every few years. The work for the next edition, which will be 2024, has already started. Um, there are some people from Sweden represented in there as well, which is good. So changes, it's DCD procurement with NRP, and we updated with most recent information in terms of utilization and outcomes. Key point is interpretation of risk for cancer and infection. And this is a mostly variable practice across Europe. Um, so there is a lot of evidence now in terms of what organs can be safely used and then what is the risk and how do you communicate that to patients. Um, I won't take you through the last but really one I'm, I'm very proud and interested in is communication and risk and in introducing duty of candor. What do we mean by duty of candor? Now we know in medicine things don't go always right. Sometimes we get it wrong for a variety of reasons. And it's very important for the patients to actually own it and say, yeah, we got it wrong. So one thing we've introduced in this particular chapter is communication of risk, but also how you have that discussion when things don't go well and how do you inform and what do you do? Um, and it will be in the new edition as well. And finally, it goes to horizon scanning. So each chapter has got a number of questions. Um, looking really at what evidence is missing in that particular chapter. What do we need to generate to have a better understanding of what we need to do? And then a future direction. We talked about an app because it's important to have it in the middle of the night. It's quite difficult to carry that big book. So I think that's going to happen this time. So to sum it up, I think it's very useful. It's shared good practice and it's up-to-date evidence. It's got readily available examples so you can adapt. But as we just demonstrated at the beginning, the penetration is very poor. So there's a lot of work we need to do to say, OK, that's a good guide, but how do we apply it to each individual uh, country? And how do we use it in practice? Thank you. Thank you. Don't leave the stage yet. I have a question for you, actually. <laughs> so. We've been talking earlier about organ shortage, uh, availabilities, and considering the epidemics of obesity and metabolic disease, uh, we risk to face a drop in the quality of good donors. And so in your opinion, I would like to ask you, what would be the role of societies like ESOT? Um, do we need to embrace and support a public health campaign at the EU level? Um, what do you think that can be done uh, to prevent? Okay, I promise you we didn't rehearse this question before. <laughs> Um, so I think it's important that we get engaged with local societies because the key point is local and national applicability is not about suprastatal because things vary. So I think we need to engage with the respective national societies and understand do the training and disseminate the good practice. I think that's the key for me. You cannot come and say you have to do it this way. It has to be uh, education, training and examples and that we can adapt. Thank you. Are there any questions for Gabi in the audience? Or we'd like to move?
also was invited to speak and uh, the, the topic there was just how to use artificial intelligence in medicine. Um, let's see, what is it, that one? No, that one. See, Technic computers, maybe this one. Should we put some? Let's see what's happening. Oh, there you go. So, thank you. Yes. Um, organ transplantation is not the biggest field in medicine. Um, uh, it's rather small, but still we perform around 150,000 transplantation each year in the world. Most of them is uh, kidney transplantation, but uh, in my area, uh, heart transplantation is around 10,000 patients. That means that we can collect a lot of data over the years. Um, but still, even if we do such amount of uh, transplantation in the world, it's just enough for maybe 10 percent of all the patients who would need it, a new organ. And as we have heard before today, it's a large deficit in available organs. And if we look into my field, which is heart failure, we in Sweden had about 50,000 patients who has heart failure, uh, failure, and of them, maybe around 400 to 500 would need a heart transplantation. But we only can perform 50 to 60 each year in Sweden. So that means that it looks like this: we have an increased need, and maybe it's all increase even more, but we have limited supply. And we get patients today which is more complicated. We also see, we, we try to increase the number of donors, but that means that we have to use more marginal donors. And furthermore, that means that it's more difficult to matching the right recipient to the right donor. So, what we need to do when we work as a physician is to choose the right candidate. Which patient should we um, offer this possibility to get transplanted? And furthermore, we have to select which is the most patient who need the transplantation when we got a donor offer at that time. And then we must also have to match the right reset and the right donor to get the best outcome uh, in the future. And this slide shows how it looks when we perform a heart transplantation. It's about four steps uh, which take place within approximately 12 hours. Uh, the first thing is to see is this an acceptable donor? Is it good enough? And I think here is the most, maybe the most difficult part, because in thoracic transplantation, in general, more than 50 percentage of the available donor is declined. We only use something between 30 to 40 percentage compared with in kidney transplantation and such thing. Uh, and you have to choose the right, because if you do not accept the organ, organ that means that we have a patient maybe who uh, had been possible to use it, but we, if we accept a too bad heart, then maybe it do not function afterwards. When we have acceptance, then we choose the right recipient, and after that, we go out and uh, uh, retrieve the organs, and fly back to the hospital. And ever this thing should be done uh, during few hours, which means 
when we try to matching and decide which patients who could get this heart is to look in these numbers of uh, variables. We start to look in, this should be the right blood group. And of course, we will look which is most urgent. We should match the size. We can't put in a too small heart in a large body. And we do not fit a large heart in a small body. It's like you can't take an engine from a truck and put in a, a small, um, uh, I don't know, Volkswagen or something like that. <laughs> Uh, and then, of course, you also have the gender and the age. And the last is that we look at how long time have you been on the waiting list. And in Sweden, it's a little bit uh, strange also because we have some region, which means that you look in the region first to see if you have a suitable recipients. And then you look into the other regions. And after that, to the Nordic countries. And after that, to the Europe. So in Sweden, it depends a little bit where you live uh, according to the chance to get the organs. So we have discussed, and actually we started with this for maybe 10, 15 years ago, there should be a better way to do this. I mean, I, I show you six variables we decided on, but maybe we could use hundreds of variables like blood samples, like genetics, like yeah, a lot of uh, biomarkers to choose and decide which is the right donor for that patient. And maybe we could do it like we could update some kind of databases continuously so we could see if this patient is getting worse and worse, it's more need for transplantation now and cannot wait for maybe one week or two weeks. So if we could have a, some kind of decision support system which could help the doctor in the middle of the night to decide which of the patient could get this or should get this organ, then we think more organ could be used. We would not decli decline some of the organs and maybe also we could improve the outcome. And today, as we saw, we ha even if we do this, it's not so big, uh, a large number of patients in transplantation compared with other areas in medicine, we still have uh, around 10,000 heart transplantation each year, which means in the international database, uh, uh, IHLT have around 150,000 heart transplanted patients where we have collected data. So we have a lot of data we could work with to build this system. And if we then also include genetic data or maybe image data, then we could build some kind of algorithm who could help us. And as I said before, we started with this for several years ago, and it was not so interested actually, it was very difficult to get it published. Uh, many of uh, the editors felt that this is not so interested. Um, the doctors want to decide. Uh, they do not like a computer to help them. But the last, I think, three, four years, it has changed totally. Maybe because we have a lot of this artificial intelligence in other areas of medicine, like cancer, but also in organ transplantation. If we look into the number of published papers the last three years, it's had 10 times more compared before, especially in liver transplantation. We can see more publication, how it will be possible to use this kind of artificial intelligence in organ transplantation. And what we can see today in the studies is that like this is what we call artificial neural networks, is one method, but also random forest have been shown that this is superior to the old way to look into statistic modeling for this kind of uh, uh, prediction. However, will it be good? Or are there some things we should be a little bit afraid about? This is a paper from um, uh, Harvard Business in the United States, which was published, I think, two years ago. I can see now, 2020, where they raised this question, 
could artificial intelligence fairly decide who gets or should get an organ? And what they have found when they have studied a lot of reports was that there was a system used in the United States to decide which patient who should get the kidney. And they had made something wrong when they developed the algorithm. So they had chosen a patient cohort which only included white people. Which means that the algorithm give uh, the colored people a higher risk point, which make it more difficult for those patients to get accepted for transplantation. And that could be one of the risks if you don't know how to develop this system, that you can build in some something of awareness in the system. And what this group highlighted was that it's very difficult to correct this afterwards, when you already implemented the algorithm, then, then it's not so easy to just go in and change it. Or, or, and if, if it gets out to the public, they said, no, it, it doesn't work. We can't use that kind of system. And they close it down. And then it's very difficult to get it back. So they suggested what is most important is you try to test it before you test it on real patient, to do some kind of simulation. And I think this there we are today. There is no system clinical use like what I suggested here. But we are coming to see that we know which kind of algorithm we can use. We know uh, what kind of data we can use. But also we must, must start to simulate the outcome using these big databases before we start to test it on a patient. And actually, this, what we plan to do in Sweden, we will we, start with a pilot project using heart transplanted listed patient. And we should uh, try to build a model, simulate it during a couple of years, and after that, decide if we should implement it uh, in the real world. So to summarize, if we try to use the data is, who is available today, today and use modern algorithm, I think it would be a future and it will help the community and the patient to get better match to a better organ uh, during organ allocation. And that means that I think we, at least in heart transplantation, we could use more organs, which, we can, which means we can get more patient transplanted. And that should also improve survival uh, for the patient. And also make it more equitable and uh, fair cases. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nielsen. Very interesting. And uh, for the sake of time, um, I'd like to uh, invite our next speaker, um, Dr. Annika Tibel. She is the Director of Research, uh, Development, Education and Innovation at the Karolinska University Hospital in Stockholm. Uh, she's also adjunct professor at the Medical Ethics uh, with focus in organ donation and transplantation. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Tibel. Thank you, Debbie. So, it's a great pleasure for me to stand here today and discuss the new law or the changed law in Sweden. <coughs> and it's, I think, very nice that in the first row I see Håkan Hedman. Håkan Hedman, myself and Bertil Henriksson, an intensivist from Gothenburg, I have an old photo when we in 2008 were up at the Ministry of Social Affairs, Håkan, and discussed the need of a more modern <coughs> regulation of organ donation in Sweden. It took a while, <laughs> and we were there many times, and since then many other people have been involved. But in a way, that's how it started, in the collaboration between the professionals and the patients. So. <clears throat> that our law was outdated became extremely clear during a very sad event at our hospital at Karolinska, at the pediatric unit in 2009, when one of our colleagues was arrested by the police 
because a baby died during end-of-life care and died with a very high dose of pento in her blood. And uh, finally, our colleague was freed in a trial two and a half years later. But during this time, and also afterwards for a while, I'd say, this terrible event created lots of <clears throat> uncertainties around end-of-life care. This had nothing to do with donation, but still, and especially in Stockholm, because we were so close to this thing, it affected our donation rates. And then it became quite clear that the Swedish law was not adapted for organ donation from deceased donors. Because the Swedish health law says that we can provide, we can prevent disease, we can treat disease, we can try to, to make diseases less, um, yeah, less harmful for the patients. And we have special laws making it possible to do an abortion in Sweden. We have a special law making it possible to operate on a living donor, because that's definitely not treating disease in the individual. But we had no special regulation on disease donation. So, and I will have my slides in Swedish. I think it hopefully will help some of you to follow me. I hope our foreign guests will be able to follow my English. Uh, anyway, there are, this really describes in a very kind of simplified sense what happens. The patient arrives in the emergency room, is given care to optimize the outcome, of course, for the individual patient, and is brought to the intensive care unit. We, care is continued, but for some of the patients, they deteriorate, and we know that they are going to die. And we know nowadays in modern healthcare that they are going to die before they actually are dying. And if we then think about the Swedish law, it was actually so that from this point, it doesn't show. You see the red star there. That's the point of no return when we find that this patient is dying. From that time point, we had no support in Swedish law to continue to treat this patient actively to protect the organs. We had no such support. And that is what made, but together with some other things, but what made a uh, oversight of the Swedish regulation necessary. And um, yeah, on this red star, then, then it's when treatment does not benefit our patients anymore. And the questions that were asked, could we then still continue to treat actively to have time to evaluate if they wanted to donate? And in those days, we weren't allowed to evaluate that finally until after death. And should this, what we can do with the patient, be influenced by the patient's uh, own opinion on wanting to donate or not? Well, we weren't allowed to evaluate that at that time, actually. So it was a bit tricky. Uh, donation rates in Stockholm were quite low. We had a meeting with our intensivists in Stockholm and we asked them, what do we need to do to improve donation rates in Stockholm? Of course, we want to improve them in whole Sweden, but we were really suffering from the event with this small baby dying with high dose of pento. And you see that they didn't really ask for more money, more time, more competence, more resources. What they asked for was a clear regulatory framework that supported the work with organ donation. I think this was a very clear statement. And we also presented that to the Ministry of Social Affairs. And finally, finally, in 2013, the Minister Jöran Hägglund decided that we should make this a governmental investigation, the first one. So, there were actually two. The first one that was presented in 2015, and some of us were on both of them, I was one of them who was on both those investigations, uh, organ donation, a vital service. And the broad assignment to that investigation was to increase the number of donors and the number of organs available for organ donation. It was kind of quite broad. The problem was that more or less nothing became implemented. It became a shelf warmer at the ministry. One important thing was implemented, and that was that we were allowed to look in the donation registry when the patient had passed the point of no return. That was important. Well, what was the reason for this becoming a shelf warmer? Well, there was quite a lot of discussions around what kind of organ-preserving treatment should be allowed to give to a dying patient to make organ donation at all possible. 
what medical interventions should be allowed in a dying patient and should the will of the patient and or the close relatives influence what kind of medical interve interventions that were allowed. And this more limited assignment was given to uh, Sten Heckscher, a very kind of rather famous uh, law person in Sweden. And we started that investigation in 2018 and it was presented in 2019. So, let's see what I have on the next slide. Well, organ preserving treatment, how was that defined? Well, that is treatment that preserves organ function, usually intensive care. And that treatment is necessary to make transplantation possible. And um, now I'm going to talk about the new law. And I will then say that the new law is not totally the same, like the conclusions in the second investigation. And there's one important difference. In the second investigation, it was stated, in contrast to the first, that wanted to allow intubation for being able to evaluate the will of a patient to donate. In the second, in, uh, second investigation, it said, intubation and starting care in the respirator is usually not appropriate. We were some in this investigation that didn't like that at all. And I would say that the intensivists in Sweden, together with patient organizations, both uh, Håkan's Life as a Gift, but also to a great extent, uh, the organization More Organ Donation, a newer organization, managed to talk to the politicians. And this was actually changed before the, the investigation was presented in Parliament. It was presented in Parliament in May this year. It was a fantastic day. Some of us have worked with this for so many years, we were there. And it was a unanimous decision. No one voted against this, which is pretty unusual. And I think we can be so happy that this didn't become a political question. It's an ethical question, an important ethical question, but it's not a right-left question. Everyone supported the new law. And, uh, it took them almost 10 years from the first investigation. And it took much more than 10 years from the first time we raised the question. Okay, and uh, what does this new law then state? And there are some parts I will not talk, I can't talk about it all. I talk about what I think is the most significant changes for the work with organ donation in Sweden. Oops, sorry, I should go backwards. So, well, it says we have defined now what is organ preserving treatment. And we decided in the new law that in Sweden we can give organ preserving treatment to a patient that has passed the point of no return. And that should be decided by two licensed physicians in consultation and of course written in the patient's chart. Before that it's life sustaining treatment. After the point of no return it's organ preserving treatment. There are th three principles to protect the patients. For ethical reasons, of course, we should protect the patients. One thing is what we do cannot wait until after death. The second is it should not result in more than minimal pain or injury to the patient, because even putting in a needle is a minimal injury, so we need to accept minimal injury. And it should not prevent interventions for the sake of the potential donor. Those are the three protective principles. Then it also states that we should urgently find out what did this individual want to do? Doesn't this individual want to donate? Of course, then treatments should be terminated. The patient should be allowed to die without having any, any treatment that protects the organs. Uh, and we have 72 hours. During 72 hours, we can evaluate that. We should not allow organ preserving treatment to go on more than 72 hours, even if we after two hours find out that this patient wanted to donate. There is still a time limit of 72 hours, with some small exceptions for a few hours under special circumstances. But basically, it is 72 hours. So, and I already told you that two licensed physicians need to consult with one another to decide when the point of no return is reached. And I told you about the safety principles, could not wait till after death. 
should not cause the individual or the body, because this is not a conscious individual, more than minor pain or injury and should not prevent interventions for the sake of the potential donor. And what kinds of interventions do we discuss then? Well, some of them putting in the central venous line or dialysis catheter and such things, they were not controversial. The controversial thing was intubation. And we had an ethical conference ages ago, I don't even remember when it was, 50 years ago, when for some reason there is an ethical border here along the, the larynx in Sweden. It's something very special so that happens when you put in the tube and let it pass the larynx. Sorry, Gabriel, you laugh, I agree, but we had to respect that when we worked with this. So, so we are so happy that finally this new law allows intubation. So, and we need to urgently evaluate if this patient wanted to don donate and we should urgently terminate the treatment, of course, if they didn't want to. And a maximum of 72 hours. So, well, what more do we need to do with a potential donor than finding out whether he or she wanted to donate or not? Well, we need to know whether they are medically suitable. And before this new law, we sometimes took some blood samples or extra or so, but that was also very questionable whether we were allowed to do that. But now with the new law, we are allowed to evaluate if this is a medically suitable donor after having passed the point of no return and after having uh, investigated that this individual really wanted to donate or had no opinion against donation at least, then we can start also a medical evaluation. And this is of course good. This is of course good because that makes the organs better. So we need to have a consent to donation. Also, this evaluation should not cause more than minor pain or injury to the donor, and it should not prevent interventions for the sake of the donor. So, we had another strange thing in Swedish law, and that was kind of when the old law was accepted many years ago, it was a political controversy at those, in those days, at not to say the least, and some compromises had to be instituted to, even, to get the law through the parliament. And one of those compromises was a right of veto for the close relatives. What is the role of a close relative? The role of a close relative is to respect today the will of the deceased one. That has always been so. If the deceased person or the one who is dying has expressed the will to donate, then they should donate. If they haven't expressed the will to donate, the role of the close relative is to interpret the will. And if they can't do that, then we don't know. In the old days then, if the will of the donor was not possible to evaluate, the close relatives had a right to veto. We have a presumed consent to donation in Swedish law. We had that for ages, but this was kind of <laughs> the other way around in a way. So the relatives could have, they had a right to veto, and that has been removed in the new law. We don't have this right to veto for close relatives anymore. In praxis, no one will bring a, bring a patient to the operating room where the donors are kind of screaming, no, no. But it's kind of a support for the relatives also. They don't have to have an opinion on this. There is a regulatory framework that decides how to do. So, and in the old days, they could also decide which organs or what biological material that could be donated, and that is not so anymore. So, um, when is the donation then possible in Sweden? If the dying, or this, then finally, of course, before donating deceased person, has expressed a positive will to donate, and a written or an oral, doesn't matter, has the same weight in Sweden, or that close relatives interpret the will of the dying or dead person to donate, or if the dying or dead person has not expressed a will not to donate. So if you haven't taken a stand, then in Sweden, you're a potential donor. 
and there should be no other reason to suppose maybe they wrote some very special uh, article in the newspaper or so talking against donation um, that they would not like to donate. But that's, I would say, pretty unusual thing. And when is donation not possible? Well, of course, when the dying or deceased person has expressed their will that they do not want to donate, then they are not a potential donor. Or when the close relatives interpret that the deceased person didn't want to donate, or if the close relatives have different interpretations, so we have different, uh, different information. Some say, oh yes, he wrote this letter, and some say, no, no, absolutely not. And if we cannot find out the dying or deceased person's will, and we cannot reach the relatives, because then we couldn't do a full investigation. So, so this is how we used to have it. We used to have to wait till this yellow square there where someone is declared dead before we started to evaluate if this was a suitable donor and before we could finally decide on whether patients wanted to donate or not. And we had a time timeline from the red star till declaration of death when we really was treating someone without regulatory support. And now we know that we can prolong active intensive care to protect organs, to do organ preserving care, and we can do that while we are finding out what the dying or deceased person really wanted. So I think uh, it was a long, long journey. But now we have a regulatory framework in Sweden that we can work within and that I think people find supportive, and that actually gradually was introduced during this time period from 1890 until the law really went through Parliament. So it was a little bit codifying praxis, finally, almost. Thank you so much.